table in some parts of that area. So I think we figured out that it was somewhere around between 50 and 60 homes. And I don't know how many of them watch public television. I really don't. I can't ask them. Okay. But fundamentally, that doesn't matter. There's a level of quality that we're not only required, but frankly, ethically bound to offer. And that is a free level of service. Whether you need it, want it or not, it's there. So. Should you fall on hard times and you decide you don't want to pay that cable bill anymore, you're still going to have public television. Should you decide you're kind of sick of paying that cable bill and you don't like Comcast or whatever, we're there anyway. And that is a fundamental part of the quality experience that we are, again, obliged federally, obliged by law. It's a universal service doctrine. It's actually something that exists. But it's also part of the ethos of working for a public television station. And we all buy into that at a pretty early point in our careers. It's like, this is important. Okay, so those transmission engineers spend a lot of time out there making sure that signal is hitting as many pockets as it, as it can. And they keep those numbers and we report those numbers back to the FCC. So there's a pretty specific process that the FCC follows in watching and seeing where our signal is reaching. And then they also do a lot of outreach to communities and they will do samples around you know, of you and community and find out how is your signal, how is it working. And then they also rely on the feedback from a viewer who is just going to reach out. You didn't sample me, but by the way, my signal stinks. So do something about that. One of the ways we do that is by you know, monitoring constantly our transmission signals. And this is a dashboard for uh, a piece of software that is uh, monitoring the signal that's coming out of Channel 5, technically Channel 35, up on Sandia Peak. Um, and it's basically monitoring power levels and a whole host of parameters that are telling the engineers, this is how well our signal is leaving the transmitter. But that's only half, maybe not even half, of the question when it comes to transmissions. Okay? Because the other part of it is, what's the person at home seeing? Now, we know we're sending it, but what are they seeing on their end? And that's a much more difficult proposition to figure out. Because again, it's very subjective. Everybody can you know, put an antenna on their roof, and they can put it on wrong, or they can put it on right. They can hook it up well, or they can hook it up poorly. They can use frayed copper wire, or they can use a nice coaxial cable. And then they can go in, and they can start adjusting their TV set and go, oh my god, my picture's terrible. And we have very little control over that. But the, what we can do is while we're out monitoring all of these little translator sites that we have all over the state, we're bringing along monitoring equipment. So as they're on the road, they're also checking the signal. And they do that two ways, again, qualitatively and quantitatively. Right? They bring a portable TV set and they pull over to the side of the road and they pull the antenna up and they say, can I get a picture? How's it look? And an engineer qualitatively judging, yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, it looks terrible. Okay. But they also have monitoring equipment right, that actually measures the signal strength and says, okay, the picture looks terrible, but the signal strength is good. I wonder if it's my monitor. I've got to go, Franz, go ask Franz for money to buy a new set. Or, no, nah, there is a problem with the signal propagation in this area. So they are constantly monitoring that. We've also built out a network of viewers all around the state, people that we know and who will talk to us. So when we get an email from a viewer who says, hey, I haven't been able to see you in Gallup for the last three days. What's going on? We got a person we can call and say, hey, buddy, can you see us? Because this guy says he can't. Yeah, I'm seeing you just fine. And you get back on the phone with the guy who's complaining and say, did you turn this on? Did you set this this way? Is your antenna actually hooked up? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, there's an actual problem in his area. We've been known to go out to people's homes and find out what's going on in their home. That's pretty rare, because usually over the phone we're figuring out, oh yeah, I did forget to turn that on. Yeah, it's working great. So. But there's that feedback mechanism going out and touching people in these communities who can tell us, yeah, 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 I'm seeing your signal. Yeah, 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 you're fine. Or no, hey, you know what, yeah, you are off the air. Another internal process we have is the Equipment Trouble Report. And this is something that goes back to the early days of television because there are companies that just had the standard ETR form that you could order from half a dozen different countries around the country, uh, uh, companies around the country, the Equipment Trouble Report. And it was the standard four carbon copy form. I had stacks of them you know, in my office. And somebody would come to me and say, this microphone has got a buzz in it. And I would pull out one of the ETRs and I would fill it out with the date and the time and then check out this box and check out that box and I would submit one carbon to this guy and one carbon to the maintenance engineer and I would keep a carbon and the original went into a public file 
and we just had these files that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger with all this equipment. Trouble reports, lots and lots of paper. <laughs> and then the internet came along in, 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 in email, and that was, thank you, thank you. Because now, it's really flattened that thing out. Okay? It used to be, I'm the guy who knew how to fill out an ETR, so half the station would come to me and say, Franz, fill out this ETR for me, because I don't know what this box means, and I don't know what that box means, and you do. So it was all kind of being funneled through me, and then funneled through uh, an engineering manager, and then finally getting fixed, hopefully. But this kind of opened it up. So now you send an email to ETR at New Mexico PDF. <coughs> Please don't do this. Uh, <laughs> I, should have, I should have fuzzed out this part of it. Uh, and in the subject line, this is the, the only requirement. In the subject line, you put the model of the equipment that you're talking about, that you're dealing with, or at least as close a description as you can. So the receptionist in the lobby can write up an ETR for the monitor when it stops working, all right? Um, the finance manager can write up an ETR for the computer in her office that is, is hiccuping, all right? So everybody, and all they're asked to do is put in the subject line the piece of equipment we're talking about, and then give us as good a description as you can of the problem. And then it's up to the maintenance engineering manager, who really is good at this, to read that and determine, okay, here's where to, and to get back to that person if they need to, to get more information, and to funnel that problem to the appropriate person to fix it. So it's really kind of flattened and democratized, if you will, the equipment trouble report. And it's, a really, it's, it's actually become a much better, much more responsive process because things get fixed faster and we have a database that that manager maintains on every piece of equipment. So as an ETR comes in, he enters it into his database and as we see this growing, okay, this microphone, this is the fifth time this microphone has been in. We've got an issue with that microphone. We need to do something about it. We need to replace it. We need to. Replace it. We're going to know much more closely, being able to track issues with specific equipment. That also goes when we go to request funding to replace big pieces of equipment. We have a history. We can justify. This is why this transmitter component needs to be replaced for seventeen thousand dollars because it's got this demonstrated history of faults. The discrepancy report is, is similar to the ETR in some ways and goes back even farther. It actually came out of the FCC requirements that every time there was a problem on air, you had to document it. We used to have paper logs and every second of the day that you were on the air was listed there as this is what's gonna happen. And I don't mean like second one, second two, second three, but at this time up to the second, this is what's gonna happen. 30 seconds later, this is gonna happen. 30 seconds later, this is gonna happen. The show starts half an hour later, this is what's gonna happen. And you have these logs for every second of every day of every year that we were on the air, you would have these trees being cut down to generate these logs. And the, the operators in the evenings would be sitting there watching and watching the signal and making sure that we were on the air. And if they saw a problem, they would note on the log a discrepancy. <coughs> we said we were gonna do this, but this is what we actually did. We said we were gonna have this show for a half an hour, but 14 minutes in, we went to black for 13 seconds. Note, time, sign. And we kept those logs and files just in case the FCC ever wanted to see them. And they did occasionally want to see them. To just to demonstrate that, yes, we are keeping track of this stuff. Well, that FCC requirement went away. Um, they mostly didn't have the manpower to monitor this stuff. And it just seemed to become a futile effort. But it was such a good process that pretty much every TV station I know has kept up the discrepancy report. But now, again, it's an email. Email to DRs, and this is any time anything goes wrong on air. So different than an tr equipment trouble report where this piece of equipment failed, but it was out in the field two months before the show was finished, so it never, you know, the viewers are never going to see this. No, this is something that went wrong on air. This show, and this is a great example here, this show did not have closed captioning. It came in, we put it on the air, I watched it, it didn't have closed captioning. So that's a discrepancy report. A viewer at home who wants to see captioning isn't going to see it, there's a problem. And in this particular case, it allowed us to track back and go through our system and find out, okay, no, it wasn't us. Yes, it did come in that way. We could demonstrate that it came to us that way, and we were able to track it back to New York, where this, the, the, the show originated from, and to the production house that created it, and to the department that was in charge of closed captioning, and to be able to talk to them directly and say, hey, this show on this day didn't have closed captioning. Oh, no. Right? And that allowed them to follow their own process to fix it. But we were able to demonstrate on our end, and again, and we have to do this because the FCC does require us to close cash, and we had to demonstrate that we were aware and on top and dealing with the situation as best we could. 
And the FCC public file, something else the FCC requires every broadcaster, radio, and television.